to an important time of the service. I, I'm excited. I'm going to ask uh, Arnie Ayers, if you will, to come forward. And uh, we're going to make him give a speech. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I tell you what, uh, Arnie is getting ready to retire and uh, just this week, right? And uh, Yeah, Wednesday. So, uh, come on up here. Come up here. I'm gonna give you a hug. I'm gonna give you a hug. We are we we love Arnie. Arnie, you have gone above and beyond. You really have. And uh, we we can tell you, you always do. You work with excellence. Uh, you go. You you love people and you help people when it's outside your job description. And you're a friend to us, uh, and and just we we just love you, uh, and we hate to lose you, but we're excited about what's going to be coming in your future, and we wanted to honor you today. Uh, we've got uh, we've got a plaque, 17 years of faithful service. And congratulations for that. And we also have a card here with a, with a gift uh, for, for you and Rita, uh, and uh, we hope it's a blessing to you. We, we can't replace uh, the blessing you've been to us, but we, we are so grateful for you, and we love you. All right. Thank you. Let's thank you all. <laughs> Oh, I forgot. Mar aren't you glad Margaret's here to keep you straight? Okay. You want it back? Yeah. <laughs> the children are going to come up and give oh. you give you their own uh, their own gift here. Pray for pray for us in our search for custodian. This be uh, be hard to, to replace somebody like Arnie. Uh, we we uh, we we're, we're very grateful for him. All right, uh, uh, just a few announcements. Uh, experiencing God will not be meeting tonight. Uh, we're going to. Well, I, it's been a while since I've done experiencing God. I forgot you're supposed to actually do the first week of studying your book before you do the first session. So, so I need to give you the time to go through that second 
week of study so that so that we can be caught up where we're supposed to be before we have that that second session so uh, we will resume that next week and please go ahead and if you're involved in that go ahead and do that second week of studying your book if you haven't gotten involved in that and you want to let me know we, we still got some books and so forth we'd love to to uh, get you involved in that uh, and we'll resume that next week all right um Tonight is drawing near service. Be aware of that. Uh, no deacons meeting tonight. Uh, also, um, our offering for Carlos will be next Sunday. Uh, so be aware of that and in prayer on that. Also, we're doing an uh, offering for Annie Armstrong. What is that? Annie Armstrong is an offering for our North American missions. Okay? So uh, uh, any, any area of North America... Uh, as they start churches and all, all of these things and send missionaries to various parts of the U.S., but also Canada. Uh, and, uh, this, this supports those missions. And every bit of what you give goes towards those missions. And so if you want to pray about that, there is a card there in your, in your bulletin. Uh, and just give as, as God leads you to give. Uh, Easter egg hunt is coming up. Please be in prayer for us. We're going to uh, see the kids... Uh, do the Easter egg hunt, but then we're also going to share the gospel. We always share the gospel when we do those things and uh, pray that God would use us to touch some hearts and uh, be in prayer for our everyday evangelism folks as we're going out in the community and we've had some good visits and um, to, so we can make an impact for Christ. Um, Easter celebrations coming up. Uh, our choir will be doing the Easter uh, cantata entitled entitled Lamb of God. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. We'll also be a message that day. Uh, so come uh, celebrate with us for Easter uh, and uh, we'll enjoy that time. All right. Also, uh, anyone interested in applying for the custodial position, uh, please see Margaret for an application uh, and return to the church office. And you can see Frank Denny for specifics about that, uh, that position as well. Um, Wayne Hanks uh, ministers to the homeless in Knoxville. Uh, there's a note there about how you can help if you'd like to help in that ministry uh, there. Uh, so you can look at those details in your bulletin. It's a great ministry that he's doing down there with those folks. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to worship your name in this place. Father, thank you for Jesus and for what he's done for us at the cross. Thank you for the fact that he is a risen Savior and he is exalted to the right hand of, of, of your throne, Father, and that he is uh, coming back again. And Lord, I, I just pray that uh, today as we worship you, Lord, that we would truly meet with you here in this place. Uh, refresh our hearts, God. Touch us with your spirit. Uh, confront us and change us and, and grow us, Lord, as we spend time in your word. Help us respond to you, Lord, as we, as we spend that time of decision. And uh, Father, uh, we ask for those in our prayer box, our Operation Andrew list, we pray for salvation. Uh, for those here in this place today that don't know Jesus Christ, we pray that your spirit would draw them to yourself, Father. Give them the ability to genuinely repent and put their trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Thank you for this opportunity to honor your name. May Jesus be exalted today, we pray in his name. Amen. And it's, it is uh, important that we, uh, as, as believers, that we uh, share with people what God has done in our lives. It's important that we, as a, as a, a church, as a uh, church family share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ this song is uh, hymn number 369 it might be a new song for you uh, but it, it talks about the importance of evangelism uh, but the uh, the tune is is familiar to you it's it's to the, the song hallelujah hallelujah uh, but it's an evangelistic song that that uh, tells of the importance of sharing the gospel. Let's stand as we sing hymn number, number 369. Tell it out with gladness.
Turn with me to John 13. John 13 and verse 1. When I was in high school, I worked for a construction company. One day we were given the job to put in these fire doors between each of these divisions of these, this condominium complex. And so we, we crawled under uh, the, the crawl space there and uh, went through, because it was an older building, it had been, been there for a number of years. Went through the spider webs and the bugs and the dirt and uh, all these things. And, and uh, it was kind of hard work uh, driving those concrete nails in uh, to put, install those doors. Finally, we, we were done and we, we came back out of the uh, crawl space. But this lady had thrown out her spaghetti in the backyard and right in the center of the crawl space. And there's only one way out. So we came up through the spaghetti and we're covered with dirt, grime, spider webs, and spaghetti, but we're thirsty. And you, when you're thirsty, you gotta get something to drink. And so we got in the rattle trap pickup truck and went down to 7-Eleven and got us uh, some Gatorade, those big old Gatorade things you can chug. And uh, people look like, looked at us like we were from Mars. I mean, we, we just, we look crazy. But what a wonderful thing when I got to get cleaned up. <laughs> you know, have you ever had one of those jobs where you just, you're so glad to get clean? Uh, listen, Jesus is in the business of cleansing hearts. And no matter how filthy that heart may be, Jesus, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And uh, Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross here the scripture today, uh, and he does something that is a picture of the cleansing work he is going to accomplish at the cross, but also of the continual cleansing work that he does in the lives of believers. Now, I want you to know something. When, once you know Christ, once you have repented and put your trust in Christ, every sin, past, present, and future, is blotted out of the books in God's sight, and, uh, and and you will not, you will not be answering for those sins in heaven. God is taking care of those things. You're not under the wrath of God. You are under grace, and what a wonderful thing that is. And this grace, we now stand. Uh, Romans five tells us, uh, but there is a cleansing work that begins the moment you're saved, and it continues throughout your life. And it is a cleansing work that is made possible by the cross of Christ, but is affected through the word of God. And it is a, a, something that each and every one of us needs. Uh, the Ephesian, uh, pa the Ephesian uh, pastors and people were told by Paul, uh, you wash your wives with the water of the word. Kind of sounds weird, doesn't it? Uh, what does that look like? Well, I, I think he's just saying, you share the word of God in your home. You be spiritual leaders in your home and you let the word of God saturate your lives and you will be cleansed and you will help your family as you do that. That's what we do in the local church, isn't it? That is one reason we come together as God's people. And listen, I can testify, I was in a church where the pastor did not believe the word of God. I didn't know that, you know, until I began to suspect it after a time. But uh, he, would, he would turn to a text of scripture, he would read one verse, and then he would depart and talk about something completely different. And he would never discuss the word of God because he didn't believe it. And you know what I found? I found my spiritual life suffered when I was in a place where the word of God was not being proclaimed. But I want to tell you something. Praise God, I didn't stay in that church. <laughs> I went to one where the word of God was preached. And uh, I, I could tell a difference in my spiritual life. We also do that in our time with God on a daily basis as we come to God and we spend time in God's word. There's a cleansing aspect to it. And uh, what a wonderful thing. You, you can be stained and polluted by all the sin of this world. Isn't it? It's all around us, isn't it? You can be stained and polluted as you go through this world, but praise God, you can be washed by the Word. 
What a wonderful thing. You can come into the presence of God and let God do his work of cleansing and changing you in the scripture. It is such a powerful tool that God has given us. So Jesus is eating with the disciples, but he gets down and he sees nobody is taking care of the issue of foot washing. And in those days that was an important issue because it was hot. And uh, it's kind of like Texas, right? I lived in Texas for a while. You sweat all the time in Texas because it's so hot. Um, they, they were sweaty. They wore sandals so that the dirt from the dirt roads would get all over their feet. And you, you can begin to smell when you've been in that stuff. And, and they, you know, Jesus, nobody wanted to wash their feet. What does Jesus do? He sets aside his outer clothes. He ties a towel around his waist and he kneels down and begins to do. Some people thought, well, Jewish servants shouldn't even be required to do this job. Jesus gets down and he begins to wash their feet. And he comes to Peter, and all of them are probably awkward with it. You know, it's, what are you doing, Jesus? Uh, you're, this isn't the job you're supposed to be doing. And uh, he comes to Peter. Peter says, You're not going to wash me. Jesus said, If I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Peter said, well, then wash my head and my hands. You know, uh, well, Jesus said, no, you've had a bath. You don't need that. You just need to have your feet washed. Okay? And so Jesus washes his feet. And Jesus tells Peter, he says, you don't really understand what I'm doing right now, but you will understand it. You see, what Jesus was doing wasn't just an act, but it was an act that symbolized something else. And so... Uh, Peter goes ahead and allows him to do it. And Jesus finishes. And he even washes Judas' feet. Isn't that interesting? This was the love that he had for them. Listen, you do things for your family that you won't do just for anybody, right? <laughs> I remember uh, before uh, COVID was a thing, uh, my daughter had a stomach bug and she was just sick. And, and Sherry was out of town. And uh, all over the floor of her car was the product of her sickness. Okay, I won't go into detail and describe it to you, but uh, it was my job to clean it up. And so I, I got, I found this N95 mask that Sherry had bought for some other reason. I put, by the way, those things are great. If you ever have to do that, get you an N95 mask. It works. And I, you know, I, I was able to do that, but. Uh, but this is the love of Jesus. The love of Jesus, he, he got down in the smelly dirt to wash them and to cleanse them. Aren't you glad that our great Savior will condescend to sinners? Amen. And he'll wash us and clean us up. This is what he's doing. And so we need to come to Jesus for cleansing. And then we need to continue to be a part, not only of receiving his cleansing through his word, but of helping others be cleansed through the word as we share. So the title of my message is Loving Like Jesus. And look with me at verse 1. It says, Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to uh, depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now when it was time for the supper, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands, and that he had come from God, and that he was going back to God. So he got up from supper, laid aside his outer clothing, took a towel, and tied it around himself. Next he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with a towel tied around him. He came to Simon Peter and asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you don't realize now, but afterward you will understand. You will never wash my feet, Peter said. Jesus replied, If I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. One who is bathed, Jesus told him, doesn't need to wash anything except his feet, but he is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you, for he knew who would betray him. This is why he said not all of you are clean. When Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer clothing, he reclined again and said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are speaking rightly since that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, so also 
you ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done for you. Truly I tell you, a servant is not greater than his master, and a messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I'm not speaking about all of you, but I know those I have chosen. But the scripture must be fulfilled. The one who eats my bread has raised up his heel against me. I am now telling you before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. Truly, I tell you, whoever receives anyone I send receives me, and the one who receives me receives him who sent me. So loving me like Jesus, how do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to love others persistently. We need to love others persistently. Verse 1, he says, he loved them to the end. Now, some of, you, some of your translations may say he loved him all together. He loved him wholeheartedly or something like that. It can be translated either way, but I think both ideas are present. Not only the greatness of Jesus' love, but the persistence of Jesus' love. And he goes on, and he tells them, he says, he says look, Jesus knew. Judas already had in mind that he was going to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that he was about to depart. He knew his ministry was about over. Jesus knew that he came from heaven. He was going back to God. And Jesus knew that God had delivered everything into his hands. And so, in other words, Jesus knew who he was. Jesus knew his ministry was almost over. You might think Jesus would say, well, I don't have time for this. I, I might, I've got a short time left in ministry. But no, Jesus expressed his love and took the time to do this task for his people because he loved them. The greatness of Jesus, uh, God the Son, who set aside the glory of heaven to come to this earth, to live a human life, to ultimately go to a cross, and to be raised again. This heart of Jesus is what we see here, and he loved his disciples to the end. I praise God that Jesus' love doesn't stop for us. It lasts all the way to the end. One day, if I live to be 90, I hope I don't. If I live to be 90, I, will, I know that Jesus' love will go with me every step of the way. He'll love me to the end. Uh, and, and then, of course, eternity will just be an entrance into the eternal love of Christ. Uh, you see, Jesus is loving his disciples persistently in the small things. In the great things. He's about to go to the cross. But when we love other people, we're willing to persistently love them. Right? You love in the good times. You love when it's not convenient. Uh, sometimes it's hard to love. Right? Sometimes people are difficult to love. But we're called to love them with the supernatural love that only Christ can produce in our hearts as we call upon his name. When you struggle to love someone, call on his name. Say, Lord, would you love this person through me? What does this represent? It represents the word of God. So that we, this, this washing represents the word of God. What does Jesus say later on? He says, you are now clean through the word that I've spoken to you. So this washing is also a picture of the word. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. Our culture needs the word as at no other time in our history. We have forgotten God. We have, we have moved away from God. Uh, we no longer have time for God. Many people are hard toward the things of God. They need to hear the word of God more than at any other time in our history. We need to persistently give them his word. Persistently. Now, I'm not saying you grab people by the throat and you force them, okay? That doesn't work, okay? You've got to wait for God to... Sometimes God to get a hold of their, their heart. But you can share what God's doing in your life. You can share a scripture that God lays on your heart to share. You can ask them if they would like for you to share how they can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. All of those things are good things to do. But it is so needed. And I thank God for, I, mean, I know many of you uh, post scripture online and, and uh, uh, are, are unashamed. Listen, we need to be unashamed. People need to know who we are. Not, not a, a bragging thing. They just need to know who we are. I visited a, a couple in my church uh, one time, and I, later on I was, I was asking her, I said, you know, is your husband saved? And she said, I don't know. There's something desperately wrong 
if you don't know what your sp where, where your spouse is going when they die. Yeah. We, need to, we need to be living in a way that is open about who we are as Christians so that people know the reason for the hope that's in us. Um, so love persistently, especially through the sharing of God's word. I thank God for many of you in this church who have persistently loved God and have served God in this church, who have been examples to your family. Uh, thank God for those who bear the burden of ministry when it's convenient and when it's not. Jesus is about to go to a cross. Judas is about to betray him. All the rest of these disciples are about to flee from him. But Jesus is still loving them. Isn't that amazing? That's the love of our Savior. We are called to show this persistent love to a lost world. So loving like Jesus, how do we do it? We love others persistently. Secondly, we love others deliberately. Look at verse 5. Next, he poured water into a basin to begin to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with a towel tied around him. Deliberately. Jesus didn't wait for an invitation. <laughs> he didn't wait for somebody to vote for him to do it. Okay? He just deliberately chose to act. He saw the need and he met the need in a very deliberate way. We need to deliberately love other people. You can do that in a lot of different ways. Sometimes it may be loving by meeting a need financially. God may lay upon your heart to give a financial gift to a, a brother or sister in Christ, or maybe even someone who doesn't know Christ. You need to deliberately take action to do that. Or perhaps it is to do some act of service for someone. Maybe God has laid it upon your heart to mow the grass for your neighbor who's elderly. Or maybe God has laid it upon your heart to clean out a gutter or do something like that. We need to be willing to, to let God use us in these practical ways. Jesus, Jesus was very practical. He, he got down right where they were in the midst of the smelliness, and he took care of the problem. He met the need that was there. And then, of course, you see, especially the, the, the spiritual the spiritual thing, uh, Jesus is cleansing them. He's doing the picture of the cleansing that would be through the Word of God. Sometimes feet are unpleasant smelling, right? Have you ever had a pair of those shoes that maybe, I think if they're not leather, they kind of get that smell, that smell to them. You ever had shoes like that? I, I had a number of those pairs when I, I remember. You take those things off and it clear a room. <laughs> it, was, it was something else. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, uh, feet can be unpleasant. Listen, I want to tell you something. The ministry of the Word of God sometimes can be unpleasant. Sometimes people don't like it when they hear the truth. Sometimes people will be angry with, with you. More often, if, if you're respectful to them, they, they're just irritated by it if, they, if they're not open. Okay, But it's not always pleasant to share the truth with somebody who is lost. Sometimes it's not pleasant to share the truth with people who are saved. Can I tell you, there have been some times in, during seasons of trouble, not here, thank, thank the Lord, uh, but, but there have been times in, in, in another church I passed where I didn't even want to go to church. It was not pleasant. People were fighting, people were gossiping, all these things were going on, and, I, you know, and, and some of them were gossiping about me. Okay, and, and you know that's not that's never pleasant. I remember one time I was sitting in my office and there was a, a classroom in the next room and I could hear them talking about me in the next room. Isn't that pleasant? Uh, but but there have been those times where it just was difficult to do the work of God. But we still are called to do the work of God. God calls us because there is a need. Um. <laughs> I heard Johnny Hunt talking to some pastors one time, and uh, he said, you know, he said, I hear these pastors come to me, and they'll say, well, I want a church where there's no trouble, where the giving's great, where people are soul winners, and where all these things are happening all the time. And he said, he said, well, he said if I do have a church like that, I'd take it. <laughs> he, said, he said, listen, 
If they're not doing everything they're supposed to do, that's why they need you. If things aren't always the way they're supposed to be, perhaps God is calling you to meet the need. It may not be pleasant. But you're called to deliberately take the action that God has called you to take. And listen, Jesus said, if you do it unto one of the least of these, you do it unto me. So if it's unpleasant, or perhaps people are ungrateful, or perhaps people misunderstand your intentions. You ever had that happen? Somebody gets upset at you because they think you've done something in the wrong way or you said something in the wrong way. And, and well, sometimes we do. But sometimes people just don't understand. We continue deliberately to serve Christ, to fulfill the purpose for which God has given us to fulfill. Why? Because this life, it's about more than this life. It's not about our comfort. It's not about us. We're serving a God for an eternal kingdom that will never pass away. Listen, I'm going to tell you, one person gets saved through your ministry, directly or indirectly, it makes a difference for eternity. That excites me to think about that. You know, some of these places that have been difficult, God has done a work of bringing souls to faith in Him. And one day, I'm going to meet some of those brothers and sisters that I've seen come to Christ in these places. And what a joy that's going to be to see them in heaven. We've got to deliberately act. Take the steps to do what is necessary that God has called us to do. So to love like Jesus, how do we do it? We, we love persistently. We love deliberately. Thirdly, we love spiritually. Look at verse 7. What I'm doing now, you don't realize now, but afterward you will understand. Now, if all Jesus was doing was foot washing, they, they would have understood that right away, right? I mean, it's not complicated. You get some water and you wash the foot off and you dry it, and, uh, uh, and but it's an act of service. But, you know, there, there's not a whole lot that's complicated about that. Why does Jesus say, you don't realize now what I'm doing, afterward you will understand? Because it's a picture. God uses pictures in Scripture to communicate spiritual truths. That's what the tabernacle is about. That's what the temple is about. Um, the rituals of the priests were about that. They showed spiritual truths in picture form. And it gave us a powerful uh, idea of what God was doing. Uh, so, so Jesus says, you're going to understand it later. Uh, in verse 12, he says, do you know what I've done for you? The idea is, no, you don't. You, you don't completely understand this. See, there's a spiritual work going on here. Now, to love like Jesus, we need to take practical action. And some of you, I praise God for you, because you take practical action, deliberate action, and persistent action regularly in this church, and we couldn't make it without you. Praise God for you. Um, but there also needs to be a spiritual action taken. You see... It's one thing to wash somebody's feet. It's another thing to wash somebody's soul. Amen. And when a soul is washed. Now Jesus, Jesus used this as an illustration. And, and Jesus may use your practical service to open somebody's heart so that they can have their heart washed. But the spiritual is critical. And we need to love others with that spiritual goal in mind. Okay? Now, if you're, if you're dealing with somebody who's lost, what would that spiritual goal be? It would be to see that person come to Christ. So it may not happen all at once. It may happen over time. You may share a scripture here. You may share an, an illustration here, a story here, whatever. Um, and God may, may bring that person through a process. But that goal needs to be in your mind. It needs to be on our prayers, in our prayer lists. Uh, um, are you praying for this person that you're serving? Lord, would you change this person? Help them come to Christ. Um, we need to ask God, Lord, is there something you'd have me share? Or do I need to keep my mouth shut this time and just love this person through a practical act of service? So uh, the spiritual needs to be in mind. The same thing is true in the church. 
If you are serving in some practical way in the church, that is wonderful. But you also need to have in mind the spiritual goal, which is what? Could be encouragement, right? You encourage through that service. Lord, help this person to be encouraged by what I'm doing. Or perhaps you need to, to couple it with something that you share. And you should say, you know, hey, God's laid this on my heart, and uh, I feel like I'm supposed to show you the love of Jesus through this, this step, and uh, I feel like God wants me to do that, that God's concerned about you, and he wants me to be a part of meeting that need. And what have you done? You've shown that person it's not just that you're doing something nice for them. You're doing something nice for them because God is concerned about this person and has moved you to do it. Wouldn't that make you, you know, have you had somebody do, that, do something like that for you and they said, God led me to do this? And it meets a specific need in your life. What does that tell you? God loves me. He is concerned about the details of my life, even the practical details of my life. And he has sent somebody to minister to me through this practical act of service. And you see how that brings a spiritual aspect into it. Some of you have speaking gifts. And God will use you to minister spiritually because you will be sharing what God's doing in your life. You will be sharing scripture. You may be ex explaining some things that God has taught you about that scripture. And as you talk with others and as you share with others, they will be uplifted and edified. And what are you doing? You're washing them with the word. Just like he told the Ephesian men to do. Um, so uh, this is a ministry that we're called to. And it happens in the church, and it happens in your family, if you're sharing the word in your family. And God will use that to help clean us up and grow us and strengthen us in our walk with God. Uh, Peter says, you'll never wash my feet. You know what's interesting to me? Some people say, I don't go to church. I can worship God out on the golf course. You probably can. But I'll tell you one thing you can't do. You can't have the body of Christ minister to you through the word of God out on the golf course. Amen. Why? Because they're not there, right? It's just you. <laughs> you and your titleist, okay? <laughs> That's all it is. You need the body of Christ. Don't you say, I don't need the body of Christ. I don't need the word of God. I'm doing just fine. Listen, Jesus said, if I, Peter, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. I believe he's talking here about salvation. But uh, there's also a process. If you want to live the abundant life, you've got to let God do his work in your life. Amen. Let him speak to you through the body of Christ. Let him speak to you through the messages or through the Sunday school class or the small group or whatever the case may be. Uh, let God minister to you where you are and he'll lift you up. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us this. I'm using a little bit of imagination, but I kind of know what it's like to feel dirty, as I shared with you before, and to get clean. I imagine Peter sitting there and he says, man, my feet stink. We're about to eat a meal, and I'm tired of smelling stinky feet. After Jesus washed the feet, guess what? There was no more smell. And they were able to enjoy the meal <laughs> as intended, okay? Uh, as we let God do the work that he is wanting to do in our lives, he'll help us enjoy life. And fulfill his purposes in the way that he's called us to fulfill them. Amen. So loving like Jesus, how should we do it? Love persistently, love deliberately, love spiritually, love corporately. Okay, I've already been talking about this, but uh, uh, look at, look at uh, verse 14. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So this is exactly what we've been talking about in the context of the local church. Uh, some, some have made an ordinance out of this and have, they have foot washings in their church. Nothing wrong with that. 
But I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is saying, look, you don't understand yet what, what this means. And you're going to understand it. And when you do understand it, by the way, you need to do it for each other. Wash one another's feet. In, in the modern day church, we've gotten the idea that church is all about us. I come to church, preacher, bless me if you can. Music director, choose the song I like. Okay? Uh, Sunday school teacher, entertain me. It's all about me. It's about whether I like it, whether I get a warm fuzzy. No, it's not. We assemble as the body of Christ for the purpose of ministry to one another. When you come to this church, you ought to have a prayer in your heart. Lord, show me who I'm supposed to talk to today. Lord, show me who I'm supposed to serve. Or perhaps who I'm supposed to give a gift to. How can I serve your church today, Lord? That ought to be the desire of our heart. Because ultimately, when we come together, we're a needy group. Okay? I'll speak of myself. I'm a needy person. You're a needy person. Okay? Uh, we need the ministry of God. And how does that ministry come? Partially through the work of the body of Christ. Uh, so Jesus says, you wash one another's feet. I'm going to tell you something. Jesus cleansed me. Now, I was a preacher's kid. And you guys have heard stories about preacher's kids. I, I probably wasn't the worst one. Probably wasn't the best one. But uh, I knew what was wrong. And I knew that I had done what was wrong. And I had this sense of guilt upon my heart uh, because of what I had done. And I remember, I'll never forget the day I surrendered my life to Christ. And the guilt was gone. I felt like I was lied. I said, you know, something, something's different. Jesus cleansed me. <laughs> he washed me. But can I tell you something? I've blown it. Time after time after time since I've been a Christian. And can I tell you, he's always faithful. Amen. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He restores my fellowship. He loves me. Not because I deserve it, but because he's good. That's what we're called to do for others. We're called, we can't win somebody. We, we can't win somebody through our sacrifice. Only Jesus sacrificed safe sinners. But we can tell people about Jesus and we can share his truth with each other. So that that ministry that Jesus intends could, takes place and we can be edified. And as we are faithful in that, we begin to look a little bit like Jesus. Because we're speaking his words. And we're showing his heart. And ultimately Jesus would show his heart, wouldn't he? He would go willingly to a cross for you and me. What a Savior. There's no one like him. <laughs> no one in history. Like Jesus Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for sharing with us your heart. Help us love people like you love them, Lord. Help us use the gifts that you've given us in this body of believers, Lord, to bless each other. Help us share the gospel with people who are lost, Lord. And help us thank you every day for the work at the cross that you did for us. Of the gospel that we heard, Lord, that enabled us to come to faith in Christ. And Lord, I pray for these who are here today. Lord, if there's someone who's not been loving other people intentionally or deliberately like we've been talking about today. I pray that today would be the day they choose to do that. Help them surrender themselves to do that today. Lord, if there's someone here today that doesn't know Jesus Christ, Lord, let them receive that wonderful cleansing today. So that they can be white as snow as God has promised. Uh, Father, give us the grace to respond to you and to make decisions as you'd have us to make them. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
I'll just tell you, this altar is open if uh, you need to come and say, Lord, I've not been loving others the way I should be. I want to invite you to come and, and you just you share your heart with the Lord Jesus about that and ask him to help you commit and, and live in that way. Uh, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, I've got great news for you. Though you're a sinner, that's the bad news. Though you're a sinner, God loves you. He sent his son Jesus Christ who died on the cross to bear the penalty for your sin, to take the wrath of God for your sin, to handle the problem of the separation that your sin causes between you and God. Jesus paid it all. And he said, as, as he hung on the cross, he said, it is finished, paid in full. He rose again. And he calls you today to make a choice to turn from your sin in your own way, to follow him, and to receive the gift of eternal life. Jesus paid for it at the cross so you can receive it by faith as a gift. If you need to do that this morning, I'll be here at the front if you want to come and have some help uh, praying a prayer of surrender and trust. Or you can come to this altar. Sometimes we're not really in the place where we're ready to surrender. And we need to pray through that. If you need to do that, come to this altar. Uh, and tell God you're struggling. And please, to God, help me repent. Help me surrender to you and, 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 uh, and receive your gift of grace. Uh, and he'll do that. Uh, let's stand and you come right now as he leads. Thank you.